I'm Tony Lockwood, founder of Thompson Wright Partners, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest episode of Inside Track, where I discuss business transformation journeys with leading figures in industry. Today, I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Daryl Woodhouse. He has a really interesting backstory that I'm sure he will cover off during the episode. There are lessons to be learned for all of us in his story. So let me introduce him now. So, uh, hi, Daryl. Thanks for joining us today. Um, full disclosure, uh, we've worked together within the Gunner Cook Operating Partner Practice, so we've known each other for uh, a while now. And, and, and I thought it would be particularly interesting in getting you involved because you've got quite an interesting background that has informed you in so many different ways, and I was hoping to explore this in a little bit more detail today. Um, so, but before getting into, into the detail, can you give us a bit of background on yourself and your career and some of your experiences today? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tony. And thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be one of your esteemed guests. Um, <laughs> so, so if I try and give a quick uh, background summary. Uh, this is where my career in two halves. The so first half was in corporate leadership in financial services sector, sort of grassroots upwards to a, a national board reporting role. Um, and uh, I was very lucky to get into some very senior positions at a young age. Uh, it, it certainly wasn't gifted to me. A lot of it was mainly hard graft, uh, long working hours. Uh, but there was some really great uh, training experience that I had around uh, leadership and change management, uh, strategy, business development, networking, presentation skills, you know, some really great stuff. And I also met the, some the great banks people. Been, the banks are very good at that, aren't they? That's, you, know, my, my, yes. we, you and I have got a very similar background and... Um, you know, I remember having the conversation initially with you, and, and, and you, you're right. That sort of that experience that you gain is is just foundational stuff, isn't it? That you can build upon. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, however, it, it wasn't where my heart was for the long term. Um, and uh, when I was in a national role, I found that it was becoming more and more uh, political mm. and. Uh, harder to make a difference on the grander the scale you got to in the organization in in the corporate life the harder it was to make an impact because there's so much um uh, other personalities and politics you have to navigate in regulatory um uh, interventions and stuff like that and at the same time as starting to feel this stuff i volunteer i was one of the first to volunteer for a, uh, a national mentoring scheme uh, where they're encouraging uh, senior executives from a number of corporates not just the financial services sector to give a day or two a month in work time to go out and mentor uh, young budding entrepreneurs and, and small businesses in in the city uh, so uh started doing that and it was it was a uh, real refreshing from um some of the day job as such <laughs> and and just great to be out in the community and, and helping who, who, who was that with what, 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 was that with organizations or individuals or mixture uh, yeah so it, it was facilitated for an organization called business in the community uh, mm. which you might have heard of it's they've got about 300 staff across the uk um and it's it's pretty much all social enterprise charity work yeah. that they that they do a lot, a lot of uh, government funding uh, keeps them going and they have different initiatives for different things so there's um helping uh, startup businesses and small businesses to to thrive and, and grow um then there's getting people off the streets uh, and so on so it's it's very diverse yeah. um so obviously i was on the one who was mentoring these these young entrepreneurs sharing some of my experiences from the corporate world of planning and networking and marketing this development um just to, to help give them a bit of a, a leg up as such and i really enjoyed it and uh, they were very grateful for the experience and some of that training i was lucky to have in that corporate environment and, and i just really enjoyed doing it and um, after much deliberation i um walked away from the corporate life uh, end of 2011 to start up my first business yep. Um, which leads me to the second half of my career, as I describe it. Um, so I started my first business consultancy and training company in the uh, beginning of 2012 and scaled that up into an international organization uh, with a diverse team, providing a range of services according to the needs of the different sized businesses in our portfolio that was building. So we had startups and small businesses on one hand, and that was about entrepreneur mentoring and business coaching. 
and then more of the scale ups moving into the mid corporates it was then more about non executive director support um you know advising at board level structuring the board keeping them focused holding the leadership team to account- accountability um and then leadership development skills training um so we had over time as i built up the business um, partly reactively to the the, the network and the, the growing portfolio we then had um, different experts providing different services across the group um, picked up a whole load of lovely awards along the way for getting results and great case studies and adding value for our for our customers and then in tw- about 2015 um, I, I kind of had got the company to quite a good point and to be honest uh, it, the business development side and strategy was mostly me for growing the business and I was getting a bit bored uh, was, was part of it and so I was actually missing um, what I started to do in the first place when I started the business and this is quite interesting from a personal transition perspective I came into it because I wanted to be a business mentor full time and a non-executive director and I ended up becoming effectively a, a business development director yeah, <laughs> for yeah. loads of other people yeah. and, uh, and and wasn't doing much to consulting myself so i shook that up a bit let the company grow more organically because we had a good team in place to keep it going um, and to do the stuff that i don't enjoy doing so much um, and and then i took on some on exec roles i started investing in some other companies as well uh, so i invested in a number of technology businesses uh, which are all, all going quite well actually so far touch wood um, and even now, despite COVID challenges, okay. um, and I also become a business lecturer, uh, which I was really proud about. Uh, one of the youngest in in the world, actually, uh, as a uh, executive business school lecturer. Um, and then another interesting uh, spin in or, or change of direction, should I say? Uh, in 2016, I suffered a major burnout, which was a combination of being a workaholic for many years from when I first uh, started working full-time um, and just being a- ambitious and determined and, and I guess loving what I do at work so much yep. really um, and, and I know that many people you know, have this this workaholic problem because uh, it is a problem if you don't manage it carefully and keep it at bay and so what happened was my body was telling me for several years that I was doing too much and I need to slow down but I chose to ignore it and a lot of people do don't they yeah yeah yeah. and so I I, I'd kind of been conditioned partly through the earlier corporate career career, that you've got to work really hard you've got to put the hours in to get ahead that's just part of the the job and it's going to be stressful but if you want to be successful that's what you've got to do so I just carried on and then in 2016 it all got a bit too much because there was a personal tragedy in my private life, which it would be too much for anyone to deal with really on a, on a, on a, on a normal day. Um, and that combined with what, what I'd been keeping at bay or, or juggling with the, the workaholic and, and the burnout that was festering, it just became too much. So I crashed and burned, um, had a chronic, uh, developed a chronic stress, chronic fatigue, um, chronic insomnia um, and a whole load of other um, illnesses connected to stress Um, and it took me quite a while to come back and to recover from that really and part of the recovery was kind of starting starting with a a blank canvas again and looking at what, what do I really want both from life and from business and what do I need to do to get to that and then I break it down using some of my best strategy for uh, approach from you know my previous work and my case studies over the years applying that for myself and just staying really focused on it I, I got to a point where i was happier in life than ever i was i had a really good work-life balance and my career was moving on to even greater scales of success and yeah. my case studies were getting better um and and, and so on That's and great. so that's great though isn't it and, and and i think there's a couple of couple of things in that really one we and and, and 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 it's a it's a sort of message that we, we we get time and time again that you know especially within you know the the, the areas that we're focusing on on this podcast or on sort of managing transformation in itself that can be a very stressful period of time 
and and usually yeah. you are running against a very tight budget running against a very tight deadline and all of that builds up the stress and, and people just ignore it and and it's not uncommon for um when you go on holiday or over christmas period or when you get to the end of a uh, end of a project and you've taken a step back that your body basically says right i'm i'm I'm, stop, I'm stopping the fight now and hits with quite a lot of illnesses uh some of the some sometimes yeah. can be, 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 be massive like 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 they were with yourself um but all yeah. too often many people don't do what you did and step back and say okay what do i want my life to look like they just get back onto the yeah. Uh, they get back onto the roundabout yeah. as quickly as they possibly can and there's, yeah. there's quite a lot of lessons yeah. I think, to be yeah. learned from from the way that you did it yeah yeah absolutely um you know and what's strange is that once i started well there was a whole other a uh, whole load of other uh, mental health related issues and stuff around this uh, this burnout as well or that arose from the burnout um and so and and I guess as part of that, I was initially really embarrassed. Uh, I, it, I took it as a failure that I couldn't cope and that I you know, fell into this cycle of burnout. So I didn't really open up or talk to many people about it. Um, um, but when I finally did, <laughs> it was like a um, massive burden off, lifted off my shoulders. Mm-hmm. Um, and then more and more people I'd spoke to about it, the more people had either been through it or knew someone who had, or they were close to it at that point or had been previously but they they completely got it related to it um they didn't see it as a failure and they actually saw it as strength as as being out to be open and talk about it um and they all wanted to help um and support me and i was sort of quite overwhelmed really in in a good way by how understanding and supportive people were and that was also then kind of gave me new fuel and energy to get through it and get back to this better place than ever yeah. um and and i also learned how many people who have been through it they they didn't start with this white canvas of where they want to be they just kind of fell into something else either they changed their career because they they then say so they attested a lot of the the burnout and the stress to the current company or the job that they had so they moved companies maybe that got them by for a while um, that change of scenery but then the bombs can come back um, with a change of ownership in the company causing a new culture for example yeah. or a downturn for an economic downturn can then increase targets and pressures or financial constraints on a company so there's all these other factors really but um, it, this this blank canvas approach uh, really did help and not trying to put business first all the time it was actually what do I want from life you know time with the kids friends socializing fitness and then I uh, so I set all of that stuff up first and then I built the the, the business work around it yeah. and to build the business to give me that lifestyle that I wanted and it's kind of something I wish I did <laughs> sort of 20 years ago <laughs> but it's interesting isn't it that you what you did there was almost um apply the um your skills and knowledge and experience that you would have applied into an organization when you go in and do the review within an organization yep. to yourself yep. um and and again i think in my experience we don't do that we we, we all talk a good talk and we um uh, and and we're very very good at going advising other people in what to do whether that's in the personal life or in the in, in, in the business life uh, or, or as, uh, as organizational yep. development aspect uh, etc but we don't take our own medicine all too often and we and you, as, as you say we ju- you just you just carry on carrying on and and not taking note of, of what your body's saying yeah definitely and, and part of that's an interesting point there as well tony is to why why do we allow that to happen um and it's partly because um i think partly there's a bit of perhaps bravado or or quiet confidence in ourselves that we know what we're doing and that we're we're doing our best um i think there's 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 a bit of that and but also it's the pressures that come with um our jobs so many of us whether we're consultants or we're um, senior leaders in a larger company or 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 entrepreneurs company founders yeah wherever you are um the the day-to-day pressures of life and a job do end up controlling us to a large degree and we we 
we then react to what that business or what that life is asking for us to do on a daily or weekly basis, which means you're, you're not kind of driving things on the front foot and proactively planning how to best use your biggest asset, which is your time. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a, a lot of what I um, now talk to people about from the stage as a keynote speaker is about um, valuing your time properly you know once that time's gone you're not going to get it back um and and really carefully planning how you use that time and, and where you can create the best value from that time um and if in starting from from that point really you know it does make a big difference it's a bit of a mindset mindset shift but it, it makes a big difference yeah and, and again all too often that that's not the case in many organizations they yeah. you know, they they will just randomly set up co- meetings and set up calls and set yes. up uh, workshops and, yes. and you go and, and three hours into it, you've, ch- you've achieved very little and you look around the table yes. and you add up all the salaries of that, uh, of, of the people around the table and, and divide it by three hours. And, and, and it's a significant sum of money that's yes. been tied into really ineffective meetings. And that yes. happens so often in, in corporate world, I find. Mm. Definitely, and, and smaller businesses too. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, um, and, and then you hear the there's the old phrase of, "Oh, we got got more meetings about meetings today, yes. <laughs> or meetings for meetings' sake," and uh, it's a cultural thing. Um, but it, it it can be changed. It tends to start from the top, um, but also people in lower positions as well. Like you know, if you're being called into these meetings from someone more senior to you challenge yeah challenge it politely you know um yeah i'd love to support you know can you tell me a bit more about the the agenda and the objectives just so i can get myself in the right frame of mind and possibly i can prepare some ideas for how i can best add value to this meeting yeah, being a bit more proactive um around stakeholder management i remember years ago and uh this must have, this must have been 15 20 years ago and um, it was it was it was longer than that actually because it was just towards the end of my um, uh, time in the bank and um, uh, uh, there was a, a, a I can't remember if it was now but one of the American sort of gurus and everything and and uh, I remember listening to something he was saying um, and it was it was about time management and he was saying um, one of the one of the best lessons he he, he was ever taught was to have stand up meetings and. Mm. Um, uh, and we did it. We, uh, I, I remember doing it for the first time, and uh, suddenly having what was, which was like a weekly meeting that would go on probably an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, and and uh, the first time we did it, we just took out all the chairs, so we had it in the same room, but we, there was no chairs. And the meet, we, we we did the meeting, and it was as effective as it ever was in terms of what 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 we got out of it. But we did it in a half an hour. You're making it not necessarily uncomfortable for people, but you weren't making it too comfortable for people. Shaking things up, just sometimes doing things differently, um, is it can be enough to create an improved outcome. Yeah. So, so you were saying earlier that you, obviously you've been involved in in large corporates. You you you, you get involved in in new startups and 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 also uh, in in sort of those uh, growth and mid sized firms. What what's been your experience in in terms of driving change in those different types of organisations? And uh, you know, is the commonalities or are they completely different? Um, yeah, it's a very good question, Tony. Uh, there, there are there are some uh, common themes, I would say, um, from from my experiences. Um, it, it a lot of it does come back to this this time piece. If we focus it on that, um, so. Um, to, to expand, expand on that in a different example, it's getting organisations and, uh, and the leaders at the top of those organisations to spend just a little bit more time planning and getting the strategy and the goals right than they than they tend to to normally do. Yeah. Um, and even if that's like just an extra couple of hours, the the longer term value of spending those extra couple of hours really challenging, really refining those goals and strategies required or the best strategies required to achieving them. Um, it, it saves so many um, risk factors, um, going down the wrong path. It, it just it just saves so many, so many different um, inefficiencies and, yeah. and problems. Um, and and that, that's just a massive um, 
and, and very common trend. And, I, and I've even seen this in brands and companies that to the uh, to the stock market investors or, or Joe Public, these are really successful brands and they're making great profits year on year. Um, but we come into them and we're like, well, if you, it, you know, why did you go down this path? Talk us through the research. You know, what was the business case for moving into this market? And you, and you quickly, after a bit of fumbling uh, from the uh, the person you've asked the question yes. to, you can tell that it was actually quite a, a, a rash decision. Um, and it was based on opinion, let's say, rather than a balance between opinion and fact. Actually, let's go and do our research into that new market. Let's test it on a smaller scale to see if the, 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 that market is actually going to respond to our brand and our uh, our, our fantastic new innovative product yeah, yeah. um and yet they've got instead they've gone sort of sort of um all guns blazing into this fantastic opportunity spent millions and millions uh, in many cases and, and and because they're successful companies they can they can um they can recruit that money from the profit in different divisions or different product lines so it kind of a lot of this stuff gets masked yeah. my argument is if you if you get this stuff right sooner you can actually if you okay you made 10 million profit on that new new channel um, partnership or, or new marketplace you could have probably made 10 times that Absolutely. if you, yeah. you know, refined that strategy you know, better um, and yeah and that's 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 kind of probably a, the key bit really and that starts at the top with sort of leadership and focus yeah i think it, it's it's um there's two parts to that, I think. One which is this sort of innovation principle of fail fast. So, um, you know, if you, get, if you are going to try something, get out there and, 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 and start it. Do the analysis work, absolutely, but get to the point of saying, yeah, you know, it's not going to work, so close it down quickly. Um, but that's, that shouldn't detract from, from um, as you say, from, from doing the, the, the detailed analysis up front. Uh, but all too often, you're right, I, I, I think lots of people get into it in, in organisations, get into projects um, almost on a whim uh, and then make, make the best of it that they can do. But uh, the pro, as you say, they probably only get 20, 30% of the um, value back than, uh, yeah. than, than that they could have done if, yeah. they, um, um, if, they, if they'd sort of sat back and, and really investigated it. And, yeah. and, and sometimes it's only, it's only sort of nudging the dial around a little bit further and suddenly it opens up so many new opportunities. But if they never go and try that and never, and never understand and, and have the, uh, have the, um, the, the, the data to, to support decisions, it, it's always a challenge for them. Yeah, and it's probably one of the advantage of um, technology advancements in, in, in recent years. We are actually blessed and gifted now with, with so much data. Mm. Um, so for most ideas that you have or markets you want to go into or products you want to launch, if you look for it, and sometimes you have to invest a little bit to acquire some of that data and inter intervention, maybe it's some consultancy-led project that, that, that needs to do the research for you. But, but there's there's literally so much data that can actually make some of the decisions we make in business much more black and white rather than going on something that's a bit gray and following gut, gut feel. Um, and then there's further, not quite data, but um, insights we can gain from, uh, as you say, fa failing fast, test talking to our customers, testing it with them, talking yeah. to prospect customers, um, involving our staff more even at the grassroots level rather than um a, a board at board level they decide oh we, we're not going to go to the to to the staff at grassroots because they don't understand this stuff anyway and they're too busy and we don't want to take them away from the shop floor yeah. um we, well, in reality take, they all yeah. most most of the times they know exactly what's required exactly yeah absolutely and that that's really simple um piece but it's it's um it's a big one and it's a common one again even in very successful companies and you, you don't need to go and interview um every single person in the organization but you just take a sample you take a couple of people from each team or each division at different different diversities as well and different age ranges you know different um different geographies and you, you take a balanced view from from uh, from that but that uh, yeah it's a kind of a, a quick win for organizations to get a little bit better at that and it's amazing what innovation you can find from 
from doing that as well actually absolutely and and, and it's, it's right isn't it the change is constant and with all the sort yeah. of new it's very very competitive marketplace and and only going to get more competitive i think as as sort of technologies disruptive technologies are coming into play um so so some of the sort of traditional business models have to change you know you only have to look at the banks to to yeah. to to, to just look at all the challenger banks that are hitting. Some of them won't survive, but a lot of them will, yeah. and they're taking market share. So, mm. so we have to have this sort of understanding of that, and we need to um, understand that change is constant. But it's also getting that balance, isn't it, for making sure that we are going down a consistent path, but, but yeah. cog- cognizant of the fact that things are happening and we need to keep adapting our, our path. What su- suggestions would you have to, to organisations and, and individuals around, around sort of establishing those sort of right conditions or you know, trying to maintain the momentum as, as you're going through some, uh, some form of change? For um, transformation projects, or let, let's, let's go into digital, digital transformation projects, mm-hmm. it's like 92% of them fail to meet their objectives. Um, 92 so is that, it, like, uh, I'd, 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 yeah. not, I'd not heard that it was so high, but I'd, yeah, 92% is it's frightening, isn't it? Yeah. And then, so when I've, you know, got come into organisations and I've looked at, um, I'd love to use some of the names, but some, some of this is a bit probably confidential, but um, when I've come into them and we've looked at some of their digital transformation plans or, or change management strategies, um, and you can, and some of them when they're mid flow, you can you can already see straight away from a quick assessment that they're not going to meet objectives. Um, and then when you you look a bit closer and you see the reasons why, it was all this stuff we we're already talking about: yeah. uh, wrong strategy or not enough time perfecting the strategy. Um, that starts with leadership, and a bit of it's about culture and structure and process. And so making sure there are. Um, clear milestones during any project or any change process and checkpoints uh, checkpoints is a quite a nice softer name for it um, and being really clear on the um the, the the objectives so i love the old simple acronym of, of smart goals uh, making sure that they're specific measurable agreed upon by all the key parties yeah. realistic and time-based um really really simple acronym but it it really helps companies avoid uh, av- actually avoid failing fast and failing at all actually um, because um, it, it gives something much clearer to uh, to focus on and work towards and the idea is then you, you you set those goals and then you work backwards to where you are today and you build the plans and you forecast the different scenarios and different paths that we can go and you figure out the the lowest risk yeah. quickest win way to get there and then you have the checkpoints through project management and effective leadership and communication that helps keep you on track or identify early on if it's failing fast in which case you can pivot adjust the approach and redeploy resources without you know losing too much money and uh, and, and resource so moving, moving forward how have you adapt yeah thanks so. yeah it's a good question and it is, it's definitely another personal transformation i've had to go through um you know i i don't mind sharing that the first three or four weeks of lockdown were pretty tough uh, lots of emotions frustrations disappointment you know we we were on for our, our best year yet and uh it literally was just rug was wiped from beneath our feet literally within about 36 hours of, of lockdown yeah. um and that was that was hard but on a positive note when i when i got out of that first four or five weeks of feeling quite sorry for myself and uh <laughs> feeling uh, frustrated yeah. and uh, and other things um so rather than just sitting and waiting i've been really proactive to to pivot and uh, one of the things i've done um with the, the white canvas approach is um thinking about well, how can i future proof what i do so i haven't done that and what i've done is i've developed an app uh, which will be launching hopefully in august uh, possibly in july and we're just going through the first round of beta testing but we've actually had this tool for many years and um, so all, all my clients over the years that i've been helping with strategy and time management and productivity and life right balance and so on um they've been my alpha 
customers for this this app um but it's involved me doing a number of intensive executive coaching sessions or the wellness and productivity transformation programs in person with them um and now i'm trying to put some of my best methodology and techniques into this app so they can download the app um, for a much lower cost um, and for spending much less of their time they can achieve quite a significant Im improvement in work-life balance and productivity um, and of course having all of that in an app it's um, it's much more scalable um, and it's less likely to be affected by um, you know any any future pandemics and so on well good luck with that so uh, if you could um, of all, all your experience corporate and and in sort of uh, your own business sort of boil that all of that experience into one core takeaway today uh, mm -hmm. what, what would that be start with the end in mind it's always a bit that just even the most successful businesses and leaders yeah. don't seem to get right um consistently so sometimes we start off and we create a really good plan but with any plan we need to revisit it we need to update it because the reality is always different to what we plan no matter how much time we spend doing the planning so start with the end in mind but not actually for the business and the career fair start with yourself what yeah what do you want to achieve how big is the house how small is the mortgage if there is one how big is the yacht how big is the second property in spain or wherever um put some figures on um on on these things add them all up put a date a, a time stamp on it you want to achieve that within 10 years and then work backwards to where, where you are today and think okay what do i need to do to create the best chance of this happening yeah. and then break it down into small bite-sized actions put it into a call it a project plan or an action map um and make sure you capture from the beginning those they say those clear smart goals um and and de-risk it so you capture from the start what are the potential barrier, barriers and risks what can get in the way what support do you need to overcome those and to yeah. maximize the chance of success that fuels your um realistic action map and then off you go to sort of one week one month at a time reviewing how you're getting on with the checkpoints all the way through adapting accordingly and failing fast i love that phrase tony I'm glad you brought that one up earlier because I'm, I'm starting to hear that more and more now i think that kind of approach is is um becoming uh more widely recognized and it's just a really good way to um focus on some of the stuff yeah. we've been talking about today a perfect place to to end so uh thank you very much uh Darryl, for 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 today quite interesting Pleasure. and, and, and quite, quite a different conversation than we've had in uh, with, with other people in in earlier podcasts so uh, that's always really good thanks tony bye bye all right cheers once again thanks darrell if you're interested in the app that darrell mentioned on the show i'll get a link to it included within the show notes below twp has some exciting news also we're about to launch the transformation leaders hub a true peer-to-peer -peer community Look out for more information on LinkedIn and via your email. It promises to radically change the way that transformation leaders find and resource their future projects. See you soon.